And more show is brought to you today by the book Iconic. Let me tell you a little bit about it. It is a very cool coffee table book. It's all about Apple. It, the background is that it's from 2009, a, game, a guy named Jonathan Zufi. He collected and photographed pretty much every single Apple product he could find, every one made since 1976, and he produced a stunning table book. It's called Iconic, a Photographic Tribute to Apple Innovation. You wrote about it a little bit this weekend, Peter. I did indeed. It's really fantastic. I've got the um, the the original release and um, the second edition addendum. He's uh, since photographed some more stuff. But if you're a fan of Apple's design um, products, you will absolutely love the way that they're presented here because uh, he's done it. Uh, Zufi has done it in a way that is very consistent with the Apple aesthetic. Everything's shot against a bright white background. Um, you get to see the highlights of the design stuff, and you get to see loads of pictures of products that actually never made it into production, prototypes with uh, transparent cases where you can see the guts inside, or um, uh, you know, products that never made it into production, like uh, like a Mac Mini that actually has an uh, iPod Nano um, uh, dock in it, uh, which would have been very cool if Apple had done it. Um, and it's also uh, uh, accented throughout with quotes from Steve Jobs and from other Apple executives and, uh, you know, comments taken from Apple marketing materials and so on to sort of give you a balance of what Apple was trying to achieve or conceptually what they were trying to do uh, when these products were developed. It's a really elegant uh, product. And one of the cool things that I like about I Iconic is that it isn't just a singular volume. You can certainly order a regular coffee table book to set out um, in your living room to impress company when they come over. Um, and, you know, it's very nice. But it, it, he sells it in a couple of different editions, including a, uh, an edition that has a glowing power button embedded uh, in the... Um, uh, in in the cover and a special uh, metal X case that actually mimics the uh, design aesthetic of Apple products in the 80s. Um, so if you would like a, a version of this with a special case that looks sort of Apple II-esque, they can do that for you. You know what's even cooler? What's that? We have a discount code. Ooh. So like Peter said, the book comes in a few different versions. There's a version of the book that looks like an old Apple floppy drive. There's an ultimate edition that ships with a white clamshell with an embedded glowing standby light that pulses just like the old sleep indicators on the MacBook Pros. You have to check iconicbook.com. That's I-C-O-N-I-C-B-O-O-K.com and take a look. And you can order the classic edition at Amazon if that's what you want. But if you want the classic plus, the special or the ultimate editions, then you go to iconicbook.com and you enter the code iMore and you can get 10% off. Uh, and there's really no putting price on cool Apple stuff. You know, we've all been trained to do that from the beginning. It's, it's, it's a tremendous book. It'll look great on your coffee table. Great discussion piece. Once again, iconicbook.com, promo code iMore, 10% off. Thank you, Iconic. Hey everyone, it is December 8th, 2014. I'm Renee Ritchie, and right now we're going to talk about iPhones being too big for Peter, maybe being too small for Serenity, and Ali has a co-host. This is the I'm More Show. Joining me today, we have, from the far-flung lands of, I don't know, Hogwarts or something, Kaya. How are you doing, Kaya? She's angry. She has to share her couch. My iMac is out of commission, so changed podcasting locations. We'll if see you're listening to us instead of watching, Ali is sitting right next to the Dodge meme. <laughs> the originator of the Dodge meme. No, that's not true, right? No. So K Kaya is, is what kind of dog, Ali? She's a Shiba Inu. Okay. And how old is she? So She's two. Okay. It's so weird when you see like Shibas next to humans because... Shibas look like Akitas, which are much bigger dogs, but they're tiny. They're such wee little things. Well, and sometimes I think pictures of them are deceiving. Yes, I, I thought she was lion-sized based on your pictures. Yeah, when we first got her, we brought collars to pick her up, like the size she is now, and she was the size of her head. So, <laughs> and, and I have people come over, like friends, and the first time they see her, they're like, "That's that, that dog's too little. Is that a different dog? Because she's a lot a smaller person. person. Yeah, there. She's only like sixteen pounds. Oh my gosh, she's like a little cat. Is yeah. She pretty much. Complain about the size of the iPhone six too? Is that is that? Yeah, like I think so. She doesn't. She doesn't really like it that much. It's All too right. big. Also joining us from. Uh, I don't know where you're from today, Peter. Uh, I, I believe you finished a rampage of Tokyo and are now heading for the Pacific <laughs> Coast. Peter Cohen, how are you, Peter? Yes, you called. You you said something about a Cape Kaiju last week, and ironically, there really is a Cape Kaiju. 
the Wampanoags, the local Indian tribe, the ones who greeted the pilgrims and have regretted it ever since then, um, have a story about Moshop, which is the, the giant who uh, formed the lands that we reside on today. So there really is a Cape Kaiju. We have Champ, who's the Lake Champlain monster. Ah, okay. It's like a Loch Ness monster, but more Canadian American. Yeah, very nice. <laughs> Also joining us, uh, Svenerdy Caldwell. How are you doing, Svenerdy? I don't, I don't have a, a pet joke prep, prep for you. I'm sorry. No, that's that's okay. Um, I would, I would go cuddle my um, my sky bison, but he's all the way over there on the bed, and that feels like a far thing to reach for for a joke. A Can't what? use the force to pull him over. If only, you know, the amount of times where I've been sitting at a desk and been like, I wish I had Jedi powers just to bring that drink or. Case, that's Are we the story. only ones on the internet who haven't spoken about the new Star Wars trailer yet? We might be. I mean, we didn't. We write something. I uh, did. Peter wrote about it. Yeah, yeah he wrote, wrote, yeah, wrote he, about it. He was upset that people were complaining more about. Yeah, that's right. Shut up on the the cross guard. Yeah, they held on the lightsaber than about the six iPhone six plus. He thought that was totally out of whack. I saw Stephen <laughs> Colbert do a riff on that lightsaber, and it made me so happy. Where he was, <laughs> he's like, I'm gonna go into super nerd science to explain why this thing totally makes sense. And uh, in even bigger news, Ali finally watched Star Wars and Empire Strikes Back. It's true. I did. I did. I've watched the first two. I still have to watch the last one. How did you live this long without watching them? Isn't there a law? Isn't there a civil penalty? No. I don't know. You know, Lex Friedman made it like 32 years before ever seeing Star Wars. But well, I was understand. close. 29. Craziness. Yeah, it's, it almost seems like you need to send international aid. Like, you have to get either um, Jimmy Carter or somebody on a plane flying over there with copies of the movie so that you can watch it and not you know, need international assistance. So far, I like the first one better. I know it's maddening. She's gonna <laughs> love. She's gonna love the Ewoks. I'm just gonna lose it. <laughs> I was asking for an edition of Empires of Return of the Jedi where they edit the um, Ewoks out, but then Molt suggested that they just replace them with CGI Wookies. <laughs> I don't. You know what? The Ewoks are not that bad. The Ewoks are really not that bad. <sighs> They're cute. All right, let me put it this way. All right, they are they are tiny little bear creatures. But think about how all of the carnage that those tiny little bear creatures do. They capture Leia and Luke and the droids. I like with primitive with primitive methods, they were going to roast them over a fire. Our greatest heroes. That's not necessarily, you know, they're not because they were incredibly dumb, but you know, that they have some reasoning for being there. It's like koalas are the animal you really have to be worried about in, in Australia. Hey, they're cute but they have claws. Mm. Yeah. Long claws. All right, so Peter, you darkened most of our weeks by going on a totally uncalled for rant about the iPhone 6 Plus and mischaracterizing it as being way too much iPhone to love. Is that a yes. fair assessment? I think it is absolutely a fair assessment, at least for me, you know, because look, and I, I said right in the editorial that, you know, everybody uh, certainly is welcome to their own opinions about the iPhone 6 Plus, but from my perspective, um, after using it for several weeks, um, I, I am not happy with the size difference. Um, I do certainly appreciate a lot of things about the iPhone 6 Plus. L let me talk about what I like about the iPhone 6 Plus right offhand. I love the battery life. God, I love the battery life. You know, it's it's and it stands for reason. The iPhone 6 Plus is a much bigger phone. It's got much bigger battery capacity. I can go two, sometimes three days without recharging it. It's incredible. You know, it's like having an iPad when it comes to battery life. And speaking of, of, of like having an iPad, the fact that it goes into a, du a dual pane mode when you rotate it horizontally, at least for some applications, is fantastic. You know, if you've got a universal app installed that, uh, uh, that makes use of, of that sort of reshuffling of, of data when you go from portrait to landscape mode, I think the iPhone 6 Plus works out wonderfully well. I really like looking at my calendar, for example. Um, and other content um, uh, in that two-panel mode, which I don't get on my iPhone 6. But the problem for me comes back to the size over and over again. It's unwieldy. I feel it in my pocket, my pants pocket way too much because, Renee, I don't wear pants of holding like you do. Um, I... Um, um, and when I've got it in my hand, I can't do the same things with one hand that I can on the iPhone 6, and it makes... 
that that is that is a um, a muscle memory issue and and a user experience issue that I am not willing to retrain myself to overcome. I really prefer to whip out the iPhone six when I get an iMessage and just start typing out. Um, a, uh, a message to somebody one-handed. Reachability certainly doesn't do the trick. Reachability only pulls down the top half of the screen uh, to within about you know one thumb diameters. I never use radius. it. Did you actually use it? What the reachability? Yeah, I never use it. I do, but it irritates me because the problem with reachability is that as soon as you tap something on the upper part of the screen up. that is now lowered, it goes back up. You know, I wish that there was a way to caps lock reachability. <laughs> is it is it really technically like a tap or is it a time? Because sometimes I feel like it goes back up after I tap something and other times it doesn't. But within a few seconds it pops back up. Now, my experience at least suggests to me that it's tap, but I could be wrong it's on tap. this. I, I haven't touched it yet. Yeah, me either. Yeah. Oh. So... It, just it goes back up after. Yeah. It goes like after five seconds, I think, if yeah. you don't do anything. And I just tapped it. One, two. And I, I will say this also for it: in the if you're an extrovert, your iPhone 6 Plus, especially if it's gold, will attract more attention than a puppy at the beach. Oh wait, was yours gold? <laughs> yes. Oh, oh that wait, is so Peter, good. you had a gold phone? We're just gonna keep on harping on you about this. <laughs> Just to be a jerk. I will say one thing that muscle memory for me with the iPhone, well, I guess it's technically the 6 too, um, the keyboard in landscape mode. I'm not a fan of, like, the new layout. I know they did it so they can fit more on there, but I, I have a lot a hard time typing on that keyboard. I, I do, too, and never use it. My problem is the arrow keys, which I think are yep. a great improvement. I, always, I keep on forgetting that they're cursor yep. movement and not deletion keys. <laughs> Yeah, that's what I do. And then yeah. it's a jumble of words because I don't pay attention and I'm backspacing, but then it's, yeah. Mm -hmm. I just think it's muscle memory. You're used to the way the keyboard was laid out for so long. I wish I could select that classic keyboard, just bigger keys instead of... So you have both, Allie. What, what, how do you, which one do you find using for what and when and why? Um, you know, up until about the past week and a half, I used my iPhone 6 more than the 6 Plus. And... Just over the holidays and, you know, as busy as we were, I started taking the 6 Plus around more just because of the battery. And I'm finding that it, it's not as big as I thought, but any time, and it sounds so weird, but if I'm not carrying a purse or a jacket that can fit the 6 Plus in it, I take the 6. And I know not everyone has that luxury, but I think that I would probably, if I didn't, if I didn't have that luxury because of what I do, I would have went with the 6 just because of the fact that I don't like not being able to fit my phone in my pants and I don't have pants of holding and it's just I, I don't like to carry a purse. I like to stick a wallet in my pocket or something and go and I sometimes base what phone I take on available pockets. Yeah, that's I, I've been using the iPhone 6 Plus almost exclusively but because of Peter's article, I'm going to use the iPhone 6 for... I'm going to do what he did, but in reverse. I'm going to go small for uh, two weeks. I, it's funny that I think the iPhone 6 is small now. I really do. I, um, George's husband has an iPhone 6, and he's been trying to use Twitter, and he accidentally blocked a bunch of people instead of following them. So I was trying to help him unblock them. And just I was holding the phone, and it was so small to me. I couldn't believe that anyone was complaining the iPhone 6 was too big. It just felt tiny. And Ren, I know you wanted to talk about the, the 4-inch iPhone. Yeah, well, so there are rumors, of course, that there's going to be a new 4-inch iPhone that will actually have processor improvements. And um, first of all, that rumor is very thinly sourced, so we don't know whether that's it's necessarily true. Second of all, we may be looking at an iPhone you know, 6C kind of thing where the 4-inch iPhone lives on but a year behind its, uh, its bigger older brothers for space reasons. Um, I don't know. You know, I when I when I had the original phone, like the 3.5 inch screen, I thought that was a little small but pretty awesome. When I got the four inch screen, I'm the three inch, the 3.5 felt ridiculous. Like like type, like a phone for ants. Like it's a <laughs> super super tiny phone. Um, and the four inch, I mean, the four inch was with me for two years, and I really liked it. And I liked the I liked the fact that it was entirely one handable very comfortable. And when I got the 6, the first week or two, um, I was very frustrated because I have pretty 
big fingers for for a lady, but even so, like I can hold this guy the six in one in one hand, but trying to do the uh, as Steve Jobs does it, the corner test where you go like from one side to the other, that it's doable with my thumb, but it's very very difficult. Um, so, like, so it was frustrating for me when I first got the phone. And then the more I used the 6, especially when I found myself going back to the 5S for camera tests for other things, um, as much as the one-handedness of the 6 sometimes bothers me, I can't imagine going back to a 4-inch screen for, for looking at it, right? Yeah. For, for navigation, the 5-inch or the 4.7-inch screen feels a little big. But for everything I do, like everything I read on the phone, everything I view on the phone... I can't like it's every every time we take a step up uh, to the to the slightly bigger screen size. When you go back, it's like how did I live with this horribly tiny phone for so long? So I, I don't People know. People are we creatures need. of habit. It's true. And I think once they kind of overcome, that's like I pick up my 5s now and I'm like, oh, this phone is so cute and tiny, and it fit. <laughs> it's like so little in my pocket. But when I first unboxed even my six, it was like, whoa. This phone is way too big. But I think that's, you know, that's with anything. Um, you know, I don't, Apple didn't make another 3.5 inch phone, even though, you know, I had some people that came in and they stuck with a 3GS or a 4 or a 4S because they didn't want a 4 inch screen. And you don't really see too many of those floating around now. Or you there don't were, hear people complaining. There were a lot of, like, I know John Groomer famously said he tried to go back to the 5S just because he likes the size so much better, but couldn't because of the camera, but still really wants a four-inch, uh, you know, iPhone with the six specs, and a bunch of other really well-known Apple um, watchers, or uh, you people who love Apple technology, really want a four-inch phone, and that was sort of confusing to me, because you, I never hear that from Android people. I mean, they had small phones. The original Android phones were all roughly the same size as the iPhone, and then at around the time of the Thunderbolt, you know, they, they started getting big, and they started getting bigger and bigger with the Galaxy S series, and with the HTC One series, and you know, even, Windows phones, you know, you can get small ones, but the flagship ones are all super Super big, and I just, especially from Android people, I never heard about people wanting four-inch phones. So I asked on Twitter, and I got a variety of replies, but almost all of them were like, nobody wants those. The smallest they want is like 4.3, 4.7 is like the sweet spot. Five, five, you know, six is, is starting to get big well, again. And so maybe are, like, are people different, or is it just people on the iPhone have had small phones for yeah. longer, so we know them more? I think it's the latter. I think that's just what people are used to at this point, and I think as technology evol evolves and devices become larger, uh, I think there's a limit, and I think right now that limit is like 5.5. Like, some of the large, large Android phones... <sighs> well, you had a Galaxy Note 4 for a week, right? Well, and that's pretty much... It's actually pretty much on par with the 6 Plus. It's not, it's not much bigger, Um and I've had friends, you know, that are thinking about switching to from Android for the first time because they like larger phones. And, you know, they, they say, should I get a 6 or a 6 Plus? And the first question I ask is, what Android phone do you have? And if they say a Note, it's like, okay, yeah, you're going to want to get a 6 Plus. If they say they have something like an HTC One or an S5, get a 6. Um, they kind of fall right in between. But I, I, you don't really see too many. I mean, I walked through AT&T the other day. I think I saw one four-inch phone. That was it. And I think it, I mean, minus like the iPhone 5S and 5C that they still sell. But as far as Androids go, I think there was only one phone that was smaller than 4.7 inches on display. And they had tons of them all around. There are still, the the still quite a few in the smaller f f uh, f uh, form factor that you can find um, basically like burner phones, yeah. you know, like, yeah. uh, the, basics, um, yeah. the, 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 the blister plastic, uh, sealed ones that are prepaid phones, you know, at Walmart or your local sure. store. But it seems like the ones they really push and the ones that are on display flagship. that they're pushing That's flagship the phones. Part. Yeah. Yeah. They're, they're larger. They're 4.5, 4.7 and up. Well, you have to. Remember, on one hand, those phones are more expensive. So anybody, yeah. you know, if you're if you're a carrier store, uh, you're going to be pushing the more expensive phones because you're going to get the bigger, you know, margins. exactly the bigger margins. Uh, even if you're dealing with a subsidy, um, so I can I can see them pushing people towards that. With the four inch in the iPhone, I really do think it's a comfort factor. Mm -hmm. It's that you know, again, like I don't think I would switch back to a four inch phone. But I see, I still, I still feel 
not entirely comfortable with this phone one-handed. I have dropped this phone on my face in bed, oh, all la uh, all uh, an iPad, because I I'll try like I'd be holding it up like like I would a four-inch phone, and instead it just goes like whack. So let me ask so, you this: If 2015 comes along and Apple has an iPhone 6s in small, medium, or large, which one would you get? Medium. Yeah. I I the six the six plus is, you know what I, I I see the point in the six plus. And I see where it's comfortable for people, but just my day-to-day -day activities, it doesn't quite fit in. You know, it's like I would I would much rather carry around an iPhone and an iPad or an iPhone and an iPad mini than carry around um, a mini-sized phone for the entirety of my travels. In part because, like, I don't carry a bag usually. I'm not really a big purse person. I'll either just have, like... If it's if it's warm weather, the phone just goes in my pocket. If it's cold weather, I got a jacket. And unfortunately, like my pants pockets, like I just I don't like phones that completely stick out of my pants pockets, and I'm worried about like falling out yeah. if I uh, if I turn the wrong way. And these phones, unfortunately, the six and six plus, as I've dro as I've broken one, like it's it. They've There's already zero shown friction themselves devices. To be, yeah, exactly. They've they're a little bit breakable. So uh, I, I don't really want to risk that. And just in general, like, I'm not going to coach with a 6 Plus. Um, I coach with my you phone You stick your phone in your front or your back pocket? Uh, back pocket. <laughs> That's how I am. I'm a back pocket carrier. I don't know anybody so who sticks nervous. their phone in their front pocket. I, I do. Some people do. I do. You're a crazy person. Yeah, I do. Both of you are crazy. I don't like it. Uh, Peter, I, what about you? If you were small, if Apple had the same phone, same specs, everything across the size range next year, would you get 4, 4.7, or 5.5? 4.7, no question. I really like the size of the iPhone 6. It took me milliseconds to adapt to the bigger size after going up from a 5S. Um, <clears throat> so I have no question at all that I would go with with the medium sized, especially after my experience with the 6 Plus. I don't want anybody to think that I don't like the 6 Plus. The 6 Plus is a great phone. Um, it's, it's a fantastic piece of hardware. Um, if I had gotten one instead of a 6, I'm sure that I would like it. But because I have the, the luxury of being able to compare the 6 to the 6 Plus, I really feel like the 6 is the better size for me. Yeah. What about you, Allie? All three being equal, what would you do? <sighs> that decision makes me sweat. <laughs> um, I, don't, I don't know. I'm, I think I'm going to take the 6 Plus with us when we go to Europe this winter because I like the battery life, and I think I would have to decide after that. After using that exclusively... I still want to lean towards the six just because of convenience and it's it's more versatile in my opinion. But the battery, the battery. But you can stick a Mophie case and make your battery better. You can't stretch out your screen, so I figure like you you can work around the yeah. battery. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so I'm going to try the 4-inch phone. I'm going to do a, an inverse Peter and try the 4-inch phone for a week or two, and then we will regroup and see who's who's crazy, who's not crazy, and who's getting voted off size uh, iPhone size island. Inverse Peter is nothing like a reverse cowgirl, so get your mind out of the gutter. <laughs> Nobody was thinking that. Uh, so the last thing is, I, I do think that we're not seeing the best of the iPhone 6 Plus yet because not a lot of apps are doing a lot of unique things on the iPhone 6 Plus. And I believe you can even make apps that just target the iPhone 6 Plus. You can't make apps that just target the 6 and 6 Plus, but you can go iPhone 6 Plus only. And I would love to see, for example, paper come to the iPhone 6 Plus. I'd like to see some of the stuff that's still iPad specific. I can see Serenity's already nodding her head. Mm -hmm. I would, you know what? If I could get paper on my 6 Plus, in a, on a 6 Plus, I might consider switching. Maybe. Yeah. There's just a lot I of... I can't paper. draw on this. Like, Until you wear tight jeans. <laughs> and then you'll, then you'll but, second guess your decision. You know what? If I, if I were going to cut the iPad out of my life entirely and use the 6 Plus as a sketching machine and basically like my primary... If I were to ignore the fact that this is a phone and just say, okay, this is just going to be an email device and sketching, consider it. Yeah, I've already moved. I, I used to have an iPad Mini that well, I still have it, but I don't use it. I use the iPad Air now because it's almost like the phone takes the place of the Mini. So my theory is this: the watch is going to take the place of the tiny phone. The bigger phone is going to take the place of the tiny tablet, and then the big tablet will take the place of the tiny laptop, and it will just readjust all our expectations. 
Oh, speaking of which, um, that the more I look at that watch, the more awesome it looks to me. So the Apple Watch, I was looking over the notifications because I hadn't really spent that much time looking at them, and it's such a super smart system. So basically, if you're just sitting there at, at a table with your friends and just talking and your arm is extended out and a notification comes in, all you get is a little tap on your wrist. There's no buzz like the phone or like the Pebble or anything that lets everyone socially awkwardly know that you're getting a notification. It's just a very subtle tap. You can't even hear it. You just feel it. And if it's not appropriate, you don't have to look at the phone, but if sorry, at the watch. But if you're expecting something or you have the chance, you can just rotate it a little bit and it'll go to the short look, which gives you the app icon and tells you what kind of notification it is. So still, like you know, if you're a lawyer and you're getting messages about clients or you know, you're not disclosed on people aren't disclosed around you and you get notifications about products or whatever the reason, or you know, it's just like you know, a personal message, you don't want anybody else to see it. They still don't have any idea what it is, but then you wrote you bring your arm up and you rotate it towards you and it goes to the full screen long look notification and it gives you a bit of the message, you know, the kind that you're used to getting on i on iPhone notifications. And I love that system so much because you know, you put your iPhone down on a table and you don't have lock screen minimized. All sorts of embarrassing stuff can pop up on there. Oh yeah, or inappropriate stuff, or and it can vibrate and be really loud. And yeah, you and I were talking about this earlier. Man. I I really like this idea of staged notifications that are super easy to escalate from nothing apparent to everything you need to know. Yeah, I um I really love what they're doing with uh, accelerometer based and movement based notifications. I think it's a really big step. I would really like to see geolocation as the next sort of little bit like when I'm at home, show full notifications. But the um, the ability to basically lightly sense or like have the sort of the tap decks uh, slightly buzz your, slightly tap your watch or your, your wrist when um, when the watch has a notification for you, you may be able to look down and it just says, message, Amy. And you're like, okay, you know, this is a this is a work message. This is not something that I need to rely on during business hours. I can just ignore it, you know? Mm-hmm. Or one of those things where, oh, this is a work message from my boss. I'm just going to lift my wrist for a second. Oh, it's just a question about something that's due three days from now. I'm not going to worry about it. I'm going to continue with my conversation. It goes, again, to what I was saying about where I hope the watch will actually pull us away from our screen-obsessed society a little bit because I think it, it allows us to more, more accurately um, divide between things that need to, get, need to happen right this second and things that can be pushed off and things that we can worry about when we're not interacting with other human beings. One of the things I want, and I'm writing a, a piece on this now, is the VIPs are exist for email, but I'd like VIPs to move into contacts. Uh, you know, a friend of mine was 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 telling me this idea, and I thought it was brilliant because that way, you know, for example, I could have you guys as VIP contacts, and then whether it's an email or an iMessage, that can punch through the notifications. Right now, only emails can, but uh, as long as anyone gets my iMessage, it, it just keeps coming through. It buzzes, it displays, whatever. I'd like, you know, they also have social um, social categories in contacts now. I don't know how hard that would be, but theoretically, maybe I only want tweets or Facebook messages from people who are on my VIP lists to punch through notifications or do not disturb or something as well. So I'd be super, you know, I'd be super happy if Apple, you know, iOS 9 moved all of that VIP stuff out of one app and into the system contact level. Well, it's crazy because they already have a, a system for that. It's favorites, you know? Favorites exists in in theory, you know, you use favorites can ignore do not disturb, so why wouldn't there be a switch in messages for, you know, my favorites, send send those messages right on through. But they're not favorites aren't VIPs. They're like totally disconnected and VIPs sync, but favorites don't. I just want some harmony there. Well on favorites, doesn't it only override for phone calls? Yes. Yeah, I don't think it works for like a Text messages and stuff. Oh, no. right now. Yeah. It doesn't right now. I'm just saying they have the they have the base. Foundation. They have the technology. I yeah, would like it have... to at least sync. <laughs> yes. Agreed. That would be nice. Agreed. Take a quick break so I can tell you about PDF Pen Scan Plus. It's the app that's made for mobile scanning and optical character recognition. Ren, tell me if this sounds familiar, but you get a receipt, you get a paper, you get something that is physical, and you really want it on your iPhone or your iPad and you could take a photo but you can't edit a photo and that's a real problem. It's very frustrating. It's uh, it's annoying because I sometimes I, there's something that's written out and I just want to take that text and that's what PDF pen, sorry, PDF pen Scan Plus does and it's made by the folks at Smile who we all know and love so very very much. They make great software over there at Smile. 
they make me actually want to smile. It's an aptly named uh, company. So here's some of the things you can do. You can swiftly scan batches of pages and do post-processing image editing. You scan directly to your iPhone and your iPad. You can quickly crop things to make them precise. You can copy. You, once it's done the optical character recognition, it just scans for text, turns that text into editable content. You can edit it easily. You can automatically upload it to Dropbox or iCloud. You can share your scanned PDFs complete with the editable text by email, your favorite application. And on uh, PDF Pen Scan Plus 1.5, it improves the camera layout and adds support for image stabilization and iPad, uh, sorry, iCloud Drive. It's just, uh, this is the app that I want because it turns reality, it's like Tron. I can actually hold this app up and scan things into the matrix, into, into the grid, into the digital dimension. You're practically in the future, Renee. I'm living in the future. I'm living in the future. I have so many old the things that I want to turn into the new digital the things, and this lets me do it with all the things. I'm so happy. So for more on this, all you have to do is go to smilesoftware.com slash iMore. I mean, you can just go to the App Store. You can download it. I would recommend doing that you know, unabashedly. But if you want to let them know that you heard about them from us, you can go to smilesoftware.com slash iMore. That's S-M-I-L-E-S-O-F-T-W-A-R-E dot com slash iMore. I'm not going to read that again because it's really, really long. But it, just think of smiling. It makes you want to smile. Smile software. PDF Pen, Scan Plus 1.5, and all those horrible, if you want to declutter, I have so much stuff to get out of my office, just scan it, upload it, throw it away. Your, your house will look spartan and beautiful. Cannot recommend it enough. PDF Scan, sorry, PDF Pen Scan Plus from Smile Software. Thank you, Smile. All right, so uh, moving along slightly. Peter, you, uh, Mark Zuckerberg was enraged at Tim Cook, and so you were enraged at Mark Zuckerberg. Well, you know, I think that this is kind of a manufactured controversy, but I think Mark Zuckerberg did say something profoundly stupid, yes. And I, I think he was doing it as a rhetorical device. I don't actually think that Zuck is dumb. I think he's a smart kid. Um, he's, a, you know, multi-billionaire. He's got to have something in the right, something, something right going on. But back in September, um, uh, uh, sort of putting out a fire, I guess almost you might say, Tim Cook posted a, an open letter um, explaining Apple's privacy policies. And one of the things that he said was that um, one of the differences between Apple and its competitors is that uh, Apple values you as a customer. Apple doesn't make you the product. And... I'm paraphrasing heavily, but that's just because I don't want to go back and read what he actually said. Uh, you can read it for yourself. The bottom line is that Apple doesn't treat customer data the way that companies like Google do. And, and he was really, I think, aiming his comments more at Google than he was at Facebook. But the fact is that Google and Facebook f follow a very similar business model, and that is that they give away this free service, or in the case of Google, uh, you know, myriad free services. Uh, with the expectation that they're going to be able to mine the data that you are um, using with that service and sell it to their advertisers. So the advertisers can target marketing specifically at you um, to try to get you to buy things. And that is how Facebook makes billions of dollars every year. That's how uh, Google makes billions of dollars every year on the, on the basis of this advertising model. Now, Apple, of course, has iAds, and iAds do target you know, customers. So the, the, the difference is that iAds is an infinitesimal part of Apple's ad re or Apple's overall revenue scheme. Apple really doesn't care that much about your data outside of making sure that it's secure and available to you. Um, Apple doesn't do that with the same kind of data mining that Google and and uh, Facebook do. And this is the point that uh, that. Um, that the, the Tim Cook was trying to make in that open letter. Fast forward to uh, this oh, more... Before you go on, Peter, sorry, it's worth pointing out because we got this in the comments a lot. A lot of people will say that in Apple's terms of service, they give themselves rights that are not dissimilar to a Facebook or Google. But the difference is that th those are lawyerly things. Those are like, we can move your stuff from server A to server B because without that, you know, anytime anything happened, they could potentially be sued. So there's ass coverage that goes on in a lot of these policies, but I think you're absolutely right about the use cases in both companies. <laughs> Right, exactly. I'm not talking about theoretical. I'm talking about how it's actually being used today. Um, so fast forward to more recently, uh, Zuck sat down with Time Magazine to talk about something else that Facebook's got going on, and they asked him about Apple, and they said, um, you know, does, does having an, an ad revenue 
uh, based uh, income, uh, you know, affect your ability to, uh, uh, to, 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 to be user-centric. And he says, no, of course, it's ridiculous. And then he called out Apple by name. So I guess what Tim Cook said back in September um, uh, upset Zuck a little bit. You know, from my perspective, I think that, that when you start um, – Say, and then he, he went on to say that if Apple was really focused on the customer, they dropped the price in their products. And that's the part that stuck in my craw. That's the part that stuck in my craw because Apple has proven over and over again that it can make cheap products. It just chooses not to. It chooses to operate in a different area. So it doesn't have to make decisions like Google does or like Facebook does about what to do with its customer data because it doesn't need to underwrite the rest of its business by doing that. It survives because, and it thrives because it's able to charge high margin for its products. It's not going to be able to do that if it comes out with a $200 phone. It's that simple. You know, nothing's stopping Apple from making a $200 laptop just like HP does or, you know, a, a $200 phone just like some uh, Android vendors do. The problem is it's going to compromise the user experience, and that's not something that Apple's willing to do. Now, as a customer of both Facebook, Google, and Apple, I've made my conscious decision to share my data where I think it, it makes sense, but to buy products, hardware products, that, that suit my use case more specifically than others do. And part of that is based, part of that is predicated on the assumption that the data um, that I'm using on these devices is mine and mine alone and isn't shared uh, with a lot of, uh, of advertisers or other people that, uh, that I don't know about. You know, Apple's come under fire in recent weeks and months because the encryption in iOS 8 and, and uh, uh, iOS 8 devices is much tougher uh, than, than it has been before. So um, some government officials have even gone so far as to suggest that the iPhone 6 is the perfect product if you're a pedophile. Uh, because the government can't unencrypt um, uh, your communications. And there, there's even been some talk of passing legislation that would force a government backdoor um, into uh, products like iOS 8 to make it easier for the government to unencrypt your messages if they wanted to. I'm glad that, I, that, that iOS 8 all of a sudden makes the iPhone the, the best device for pedophiles, as screwed up as that sounds. I want my stuff private. I want my stuff secure. I don't want to be able to give or I don't want my data given away unless I specifically know about it. Now I've made peace with the fact that Facebook and Google have the information that they have and um, whatever, but it certainly affects what information I choose to share with those services compared to how I use my Apple devices. I don't think about that as much with Apple. I do when I'm using those services which means self-censorship, which means uh, curtailing what I might communicate otherwise. Don't really worry about that so much on my, my, my iPhone when I'm away from Facebook or Google Apps. Yeah, I think that whenever you hear uh, the, the pedophile argument raised or the backdoor argument raised, you know that's done for sensationalism. That's not done for any sane or rational um, discourse. Think of the children. Yeah, think yeah. of the children. You want to talk about an easy, it's, it's FUD, right? Yes. You know, it's it's trying to amp up fear and concern to get a law that's not necessarily good for the majority of humans passed. Yeah, and you made an excellent point. Uh, Serenity was on This Week in Tech last night, Twitter last night, and you were saying that, you know, you created a government, uh, backdoor for the government and who knows who else is using it. Exactly. I mean, when you, when you put a hole in code, um, you may think it's secret for, and it may stay secret for a little bit, but that hole is there, and there are enough enterprising black hat folks out there who are going to be like, oh, you know, the NSA wants mandated backdoors. Let's show them how terrible an idea this is. Yeah. Like it's, just, it's our commute. Our, well, human, humans are mischievous. They're mischievous. <laughs> like, it just happens. And it comes back to the majority. It, that's not good for the majority. You're talking a minority of people that commit crimes. It, that's not the majority of users. And putting backdoors there that make the majority of users susceptible is not in anyone's best interest. So I had a I, I have a I have a couple of rants here. One is that I 
I don't like the way that Google and Facebook talk about payment or, or expense or price because they refer to money as being the only thing that that is valuable or costly or that you pay with. And you can pay with money, absolutely, but you can also pay with time, and you can pay with attention, and you can pay with data. And those are more abstract, but they're no less real. Like paying money is easy to see. I know some people abuse credit cards or or you know stuff like that. So some people do have an unrealistic um, sense of money, but for the most part, you have a hundred dollars. You know you can spend a hundred dollars. If you if you have the skill and time, you can code your own stuff. You can take you know Android open source project and make your own phone. But that's incredibly work intensive. But if you have no money and tons of time, maybe that's for you. That's great. But then you know maybe you don't have money and you don't have that time or that skill. You can still pay with attention. You can look at ads or you can pay with data. You can share your information and get subsidized product subsidized subsidized products but that is still payment you are still giving up something of value for those and just because it's a more abstract policy and because we're not as used to it and we're not as familiar with it I don't think that it deserves like I don't think that that people should think that it's trivial or that it should be made to seem like you're not sacrificing something for what you're getting because you really get you never get anything for nothing no uh, and the last thing is there's been these security stories lately there was one up on TechCrunch um, uh, written a guest post by uh, someone who does a security software, antivirus software, saying Apple has to open up to make the iPhone more secure. And to Serenity's point, you open up and bad guys get in, but also you open up in terms of open source, and that's no guarantee either. I mean, uh, uh, Heartbleed, Go to Fail, all of these were in open code bases that no one had seen. There's just way too much code and too few humans looking at it for that to be any sort of rational answer. And then over the weekend, there was another po uh, a white paper that ZDNet basically um, just regurgitated that, again, was saying that Apple, because of things like Wire Lurker and Mask Attack, was open to vulnerabilities in the enterprise and that Apple had to let antivirus on, on the iPhone to combat these things, and it's it's just absolute bullshit. It's it's the kind of fear, uncertainty, and doubt. You open it up to antivirus, that's going to be the same vector that viruses use to get in. I, Apple's got excellent security on iOS 7 and iOS 8. You have to go out of your way to disable things. And the point that really upset me about this is their whole line of thinking was that users cannot be trusted. We cannot be trusted to say no to um, things that ask us for permission to access. You get a big do not trust this dialog box and you have to override it or you have to jailbreak or you have to do something that shows you intend to let the stuff onto your system and they think that we're not trustworthy for this so their system should be in there to protect us uh, and it's just such a canard um, and it's just a virus again I've, I've said this before but the security part reporting really annoys me because inevitably my mom watches BBC gets panicked and calls me and that's just a terrible terrible shameful thing that these people are doing and I wish they would cut it out well, I think a lot of it's bad due diligence with reporters, too. It, you know, it, I feel like in a lot of the times, especially with big media, it's turning into a, how much research are we really doing before we publish a story? It, the Internet has made it so easy to do that. I just feel like that creates part of the problem, too. Mm -hmm. Well, we, I mean, we're four people, like, and we make a lot of mistakes. I make tons of mistakes. We fix, we find them, we fix them. These articles, the people in the comments pointed out the mistakes. They, as far as I know, they did not update the stories. But today, we were talking about a potential problem that we were facing in iOS, and we're like, well, let's check. Let's all of us check to make sure we have that problem. We'll check with Apple to make sure if it's a known problem or not. Like, it's not just, oh my God, my phone is, you know, shooting flames out of the lightning port. Uh, I'm going to report it. I, I wish that people would slow down a little bit, especially with security uh, things or things that do affect people's lives and take a minute and sanity check it before they post First it. First isn't always best. First is almost never best. Yeah. Unless it's first one to get a milkshake at the table. Yeah. <laughs> Take a quick break so I can tell you about lynda.com. It is an easy and affordable way to help you learn to instantly stream thousands of courses created by experts on software, web development, photography, graphic design, and more. Do you know what I like best about lynda.com, Peter? What do you like best about lynda.com? It's like the Matrix. Like, you know that scene in the Matrix where he doesn't know how to fly a helicopter and then he presses a couple buttons and he knows how to fly a helicopter? Yes. Yeah, it's not quite like that, but I cannot know how to use logic or not know how to use Xcode or not know how to use Yosemite. I can press a few buttons, watch a video, and suddenly I know these things. I get it, yeah, and having used Lynda.com, my experience has been much the same. It's a great online repository of knowledge that you wouldn't be able to get otherwise. Ren, it could even make me a thespian. 
Oh boy, that's that'd be an interesting proposition right there. I don't know if it's true. I don't know if I can actually learn to act on on Linda, but I, everything that I have wanted to learn, especially when it's related to software, is right there. I mean, they have industry experts. They have. If you want to learn Photoshop, if you want to learn Final Cut Pro or Premiere or anything, they have the people who have made incredibly successful careers doing these things. And there's new content added daily. So even if I cannot learn acting now, maybe one day I'll be able to learn acting. I do think Linda has a has a stop motion course. So Ooh. I mean, that's that's one step removed. That's that's almost as good as fellow Canadian actor William Shatner. <laughs> almost. <laughs> yeah, you know what? It's totally great. They make it easy. It's high quality videos. There's for beginners, for intermediates, for experts. Uh, you can stream them to your iPhone, your iPad, your Android device. You can even get uh, a premium plan that lets you lo lets you download them and store them offline and get course to to follow along with. Just amazing stuff. Best of all, it's one low price. It's twenty five dollars a month. That gives you unlimited access to over one hundred thousand uh, videos, including things like. Uh, iOS 8 essentials, iPad tips and tricks, create an iPad web app, shooting with the iPhone 5S, setting up your mobile office. It's just everything you could possibly think of. Um, best of all, we've worked out a deal with Linda so you can get a special offer. You can access all of their videos for free for seven days. If you're not as sure, if you're not positive that Linda is for you, I just urge you to go there, try it out. It's absolutely free. The worst thing that can happen to you is that you learn. You know, like, like you will be better off. You will have more information, more knowledge, greater than, way better than uh, you did previously. Free for seven days. All you have to do is go to lynda.com slash imore, L-Y-N-D-A.com slash imore. Sign up seven days for free. If you like it, like I think you will, you can just sign up and continue. Otherwise, just a lot of free information for your brain. It is, it is, it is a holiday miracle. I'm calling it holiday miracle. Thanks, Linda. <laughs> All right, moving along. Um, Ali, what's the difference between iCloud Photo Library and PhotoStream? Because I'm super confused. Uh, so we covered an article on this. Um, basically, a lot of people are confused because when you go into the settings panel, and I'll pull it up here, um, when you go into settings and then photos, or you can access it through the iCloud panel, um, iCloud Photo Library is still in beta, so you still have the option for iCloud or for just regular My Photo Stream. Um, if you have iCloud Photo Library enabled, basically that overtakes. You don't have a camera roll anymore or an individual photo stream that's private. Um, you now have an all photos. And the reason for that is because it's combined. It's all based in the cloud. Um, but My Photo Stream is still there simply because of the fact that Mac, and I, I don't think the PC version of iCloud Control Panel uh, supports iCloud Photo Library yet too. It supports Drive, but not iCloud Photo Library. So there has to be a median there. So when you take a picture on your iPhone or iPad, it still goes to your Mac. Um, and then you also have to look at iCloud Photo Library does not have a limit. If your photo storage can support it, iCloud Photo Library will support it. So if you have a one terabyte plan, um, you can save as many photos as you want, as many as iCloud will hold. Um, the traditional version of PhotoStream, if you opt for no iCloud photo library, um, that still has the 1,000 photos or 30 days, whichever is greater. It does not count against your iCloud storage. So I think there was some confusion about whether or not that was going to go away when Apple releases a new Photos app for Mac. I don't think it will because there's still going to be a lot of people that maybe don't want to pay for iCloud storage for photos and they might still opt to use the traditional version of PhotoStream. My guess would be when iCloud Photo Library comes out of beta and there's iCloud Photo Library support across OS 10, iOS, um, PC, Windows, uh, then you might not see the My Photo Stream option if you have iCloud Photo Library enabled. I think right now it's there. It's a median. It's a median. It's kind of like a band-aid until they fix whatever's going on with well when photos for Mac comes out. <laughs> yeah, it's a it's a giant cluster mess right now um, because there's no real way for for us to focus on um, focus on just having iCloud Photo Library on your iOS device and then having it not sync to your Mac. It's like photos are such an important part of the iOS device sphere as well as you know, if we take photos that are not iPhone or iPad related on your Mac, and maybe Apple is like, oh, no one's using a DSLR anymore. We don't have to worry about those people. But it's that's not actually true. Like, we know, 
although like the majority of people have probably switched over to taking photos with their mobile devices, we're still going to be in a situation where uh, people are going to want to use their DSLR or they're going to want to use their pocket camera or they're going to want to well, use their video camera. Or they have a smaller device and over time they've dumped photos onto their hard drive that they've synced certain albums to their phone and then the first time they enable iCloud Photo Library, I think the reaction is, oh my god, all the albums that I had from iTunes are gone. Um, and I think when Photos comes out for Mac and whatever they do with Windows, um, that'll simplify some of that. Uh, I know you had some luck with the photo uploader on the beta it's, website. It's really rudimentary, though. It's just JPEGs, and that makes it really difficult. Yeah, see, I can't even get it to load. When I actually go like into iCloud.com, I click on the... Uh, photos icon and it does nothing but time out. I can't even get it to load. Yeah, it's um, it's well, especially if you're uploading more than like a hundred photos at a time. And on top of that, I mean, I've I've been cranky about this before, and I'll probably post an op-ed on the site at some point. Uh, but the fact that there's no way to say I would not like the you know sync the last five hundred, but any yep. any more than that, just keep them in the cloud and let me pull them down when I want. That's really frustrating because, I mean, I have a 64 gigabyte iPhone, but for anybody who has, you know, a 16 gig iPhone mm -hmm. and you're trying to store any amount of photos in iCloud Photo Library, you're, you're screwed really quickly. I found your trick on creating shared photo streams with yourself, mm -hmm. I started using, I have an immensely large library just of everything from, and a lot of those it. photos, pretty much, yeah, they're sheep photos. Um, but just from traveling and just over time, like, I have thousands of photos built up from, like, a decade. And I figured out that, well, I think iCloud, when you do a shared photo stream, it only saves thumbnails. So it doesn't save as much of the picture data. Mm -hmm. So a lot of those photos that I want to be able to access when I want to, but I don't want them eating up tons of storage, using shared photo streams eats a lot less storage space than having them in iCloud Photo Library. So I think I'm going to start using that trick as a way to save storage because then I at least have, even if they're lower res versions of those photos, I'm okay with that. I mean, I don't necessarily need pictures on my phone all the time of vacation from five years ago, but at some point maybe I'd like to show my grandpa or, you know, at an inopportune time I won't have them. So that's kind of a convenient way to do it. You just, you're not using as much storage to do it that way. iCloud Photo Library... It, it's it's a funny it's a funny beast. It, it's eating a lot of space, and I've noticed that my iCloud photo library seems to eat more space than I really feel I have uploaded into it. Um, it's telling me I have like eight gigs worth of stuff in iCloud photo library, and I have seven hundred pictures and like five videos. It's kind of crazy. So I'm so confused because I have no idea what I'm using anymore. I think on my iPhone it has iCloud Photo Library enabled, but on my Mac there's still PhotoStream. But if I take a screenshot on my iPhone, it still shows up in PhotoStream on my Mac. But on my MacBook Pro, because the, my install of Aperture is so old, I have separate Aperture and iPhoto libraries. And there I have no idea what it's doing anymore. If I try to say activate it, it says, well, you're not using the right library. Do you want to use a different library? But on my MacBook Air, which was newer, it, it's using a combined Aperture and iPhoto library. And it does pick up the photo stream. But then if I take DSLR pictures and pull them into uh, Aperture there, it uploads them to iCloud Drive. So now I have a bunch of DSLR photos in PhotoStream coming from that computer, but not coming from my Mac Pro. And I, I, I'm getting learned helplessness. No, to be perfectly honest, um, I think Aperture is kind of SOL at this point because they basically unofficially, they're like, sorry, Aperture's going away. We might, you know, reintroduce it in some way, but uh, it's essentially dead in the water. Um, I, I honestly think that Apple is not even putting that much effort into making sure that everything works right now. They're just kind of closing their eyes and gunning for spring 2015 and being like, I know it's weird now, but it'll be okay soon, we promise. And what really frustrates me is I'm like, why why not just launch it next spring, guys? Why why do this half-in, half-out nonsense? Yeah, why not make it an 8.2 or an 8.3 feature? Exactly. Well, it's so, I mean, fine. Say that it's coming. Because it's really awesome. I'm really glad that it is, you know, coming. Um, and I think that it will be a really cool feature. And maybe, yeah, you're getting pressure from the drop boxes and and such of the world to add such a feature. But you can't if you can't do it if it's not ready for prime time. 
Why is it being released? This is not that's not an Apple thing that usually happens. A, a great experience later on is typically better than a mediocre or bad experience early on because then people I think that scares people away. Exactly. So I know a lot of people that said they turned on iCloud Photo Library and all their crap was gone and they turn it off <laughs> right away and then they're not going to turn it back on ever again. So, you know, which reaction is worse? I think that's probably worse than just waiting. Thanks to Ali and Peter, there's so many show titles I can't use today. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I, had a, I did a similar thing over continuity and sync because one of the questions I kept getting asked was, you know, I already have sync. What's the big deal about continuity? And even other vendors were trying to introduce continuity-like or things that they said were like continuity, but they weren't because they were either like sync or like airdrop. And continuity is really a little bit different. So I took a, a few minutes to try to explain it. And the best thing I can, I, the best way I can put it is, you know, if I want to airdrop something to Peter, I press a button and I push it from my phone to his phone, for example. But continuity is not like that. It, with a traditional sync thing, if I get an email, it goes to a server, and then from that server, it pushes down to my iPhone, my iPad, my Mac, and I can go look at that email on any phone. I can reply to it. That'll go up to the server, then that'll get synced back down to everything else. If I make a, a, a pages document on one device or update my book um, marks on one device, that'll go up to the server and then push down to the other devices. And handoff is really different. Handoff... Um, I should explain, like, uh, that email doesn't matter if I'm doing it, you know, seven hours later and 300 miles away. It's, it's just always syncing. Handoff is very specific. So if I have something I'm working on on my Mac, like if I'm working on Pixelmator on my Mac and I'm doing a bunch of pixel precise things with a mouse or with a trackpad, and then I just want to go sketch, I can pick up my iPad and I don't have to go looking for Pixelmator. Yes, the data is all synced, but I don't have to open the, open the iPad, go to the home screen, swipe across till I get to my... my uh, drawing apps, open the folder, press Pixelmator, open Pixelmator, open the dialog, go find the file, open it, go to the exact place that I was and keep going. I pick up that iPad and on the lock screen there's an icon for Pixelmator and I swipe up and I'm exactly where I was a few seconds ago working. So yes, I have to be proximal to it, I have to be close to it in space and close to it in time. It's like immediately thereafter. But for those kind of workflows it's really different and really useful compared to Sync. You know, if I'm doing something on my iPhone and I have to reply to a message to Ali and I'm just, I'm having, you know, I want to write a lot of stuff and the iPhone keyboard is frustrating me, I just put that down. I don't have to go to the, my Mac, go, go to the dock, launch mail, wait for it to load, go through the messages, try to find the message again, copy the text over somehow or go back and save it as drafts and open the draft. I just click on the, on the mail continuity icon, mails up and I continue writing that same email. And that, to me, is it's it's subtly different, but it's also tremendously different. And I think that's what makes sort of the, the handoff that interesting. Well, it's about seamlessness, right? You know, sync, was, sync is very nice in that it gives us the documents. It gives us the, the base level of, okay, this is where, this is on all of my computers and I can access the raw data. Uh, but being able to pick up, pick up in the exact place where you left off makes it, and you said this in your article, Renee, it makes it such a nicer experience to switch between devices. Whereas before, um, I would write entire emails on my phone that I really should have been writing on a full-sized keypad just because I'm like, well, I started it. And you know what? It's just too much <laughs> trouble. And it's really not that many more steps, right? It's really not that many more steps to click the draft and open the draft. It's like three or four, but mentally it feels like so much more time. And it's why I like it's why I resisted getting one password and and getting text expander for so long is I was like, well, this will make it easier, but then but I have to fill in all the data first and there's just there's the barrier to entry. Our brains are wired in such a way that if it's if it looks like it adds extra work, we don't want to do it, even if the reality is it's not really that much extra work. So the fact that handoff is really so seamless that I can have like an email open on my phone and then that little bubble pops up on all of my Macs and my and my iPads, and tapping that will get me not only to the email but to the exact word where I left off on the other device. Like that's really cool. Um, I've I've been sort of touting Pixelmator support for this for a couple of weeks because I. I really am blown away by the fact that, um, you know, syncing photos is sometimes it's still a tedious effort um, if you're just, if you're taking, you know, um, 
editing screenshots and you know there's airdrop and there are a variety of different ways to do it um, but Pixelmator not only is Pixelmator a good editing experience on the iPad because of just touch based controls feel more intuitive for photo and video editing they just do so being able to edit a photo really really quickly on Pixelmator and like being like okay I'm gonna paint in this and I'm gonna remove this and I'm going to resize this alright and then I just press a button and it pops up on my Mac and then I'm from there I can save it directly and upload it to uh, to our to our media server or put it on Twitter or wherever we want like that's it's so neat to be able to be like yeah I'm gonna use I'm gonna transfer my edits from one place to the other and I can do it seamlessly and they're non-destructible so uh, so you can you know undo things on the Mac like it's just a, it's such a good workflow it's, yeah. it feels so comfortable and my only real downside like my, my sadness with continuity and handoff right now is just that there aren't that many apps that support it yet uh, which is I mean I understand like sync sync is the is a giant white elephant um, or white whale when it comes to implementing it for developers and I have no doubt that handoff is equally scary so I understand why they why they haven't really appeared in all of our favorite apps yet or maybe the, just the apps have no real idea of how to how to move things or like what how it would fit properly in their app but um, all of that said, like the experience is so great when it works that I really just I, I want to see more. I I, mm. I feel like this is an untapped, an untapped uh, place of exploration for us. Yeah, I agree completely. There's so many apps that I want to. I mean, I think Byword is the only word processor that's doing it now as well. I mean, we there's just we should make a list. Let's make a list of apps we want to go continuity. We'll put some pressure on them. Yeah. Wagging fingers. Sorry, guys. I know you want to enjoy your Christmas holidays, but instead, code for us monkeys. <laughs> so, in in more frustrating news, uh, there, there's been more rejections over widgets. A couple for keyboards. Uh, we just saw one for Panic and iCloud um, Drive. Uh, we haven't got the details on that yet. They said they'll blog about it today, so we'll follow up on it. But I, I wrote a piece about what's happening with widgets because I think the App Store is such a black box to some people that it, it's hard to tell what's really going on. I think one of the biggest things that, that's not really understood is that Apple isn't a person. It's not a hive mind. It's not a group think. So when you say like Apple's rejecting this, that's what it looks like to us and absolutely that's the way that you know anyone who's looking at it from the outside is going to look at it. But internally there's all these different groups and people and opinions and discussions going on that's not dissimilar to what you hear on your favorite tech podcast. Just imagine those discussions going on inside and people saying, well, I think this is a really terrible experience because people are going to tap this and they're going to change context, they're going to be confused, they're not going to understand it. Other people are going, well, you're not giving them enough credit. It's going to be, you know, there'll be some growing pains, but it's going to be really cool functionality. Other people are going, look, we said this originally, and other people say, no, this is flexible. And there really are these big debates. Apple has an executive review committee so that when things are appealed, they can go through these discussions. And we saw it with PCALC, and that was ultimately approved. Now we're seeing it with drafts because they had a button in drafts that didn't just do something in the widget but sent you back to the app to do something. And that, you know, that was felt to be not an ideal situation by some people inside Apple. So it's incredibly frustrating because Apple doesn't make these rules really well known ahead of time. And some people wish that they would, but the problem with making all these rules beforehand is that Apple believes there's a lot of unforeseen stuff, that there'll be developers who make cool stuff that should be in the App Store. So, for example, if the App Store said no calculator widgets, James Thompson would never have made the PCALC widget. He might have lobbied you know, for Apple to change the rule, but he wouldn't have made it, and then it wouldn't have gotten appealed. It wouldn't have gone to review, and we wouldn't have been approved, and we wouldn't have that widget today. So we got calculator widgets faster than we would have otherwise because the rules were more nebulous and people could test them. Now, that's horrible for developers because they sometimes work a lot only to be rejected and it's sort of Apple prioritizing their own self-interests and a little bit the interests of customers ahead of developers but that has absolutely always been the case and it is terrible if you're a developer who really wants to push the boundaries and do things that are unexpected but it's the same procedure Apple's been using since the launch of the App Store and while it really does suck for everybody I mean Apple gets terrible press developers get huge frustration and users get angry at everybody I, I the, all of all the suggestions that I've seen, I I haven't seen any that have really fix all these problems. So I think we're just going to continue seeing them until extensions get older and we everyone gets a better idea of what we well what is permissible and what's not. Buzzkill. Yeah, it's. I mean, 
It really is growing pains time, right? I mean, we really have to be... It's it's because it is a, techno a new technology, people are going to test boundaries, people are going to push limits, people are going to design things that Apple hasn't anticipated. And unfortunately, we're going to get a lot of, oh, how dare Apple approve my app and then retract it. Uh, a lot of that founded and some of it completely unfounded. It just, I, it's just... It's frustrating. I wish Apple would be slightly more transparent to developers and not... I wish someone would, from Dev Relations would call people who, you know, have already posted... Um, you know, like, if their apps have already made it to the store and Apple's decided that mm, maybe this isn't so great, I wish they'd have Dev, pe dev Relations call them first and be like... Hey, so here's a thing that's going on, um, just to let you know, and then have the developer actually have a direct contact rather than just the omniscient email of, for your next update, you must remove this yeah. feature or, you're, or it will not be approved. Like, that's not the way to treat the people who are making money for you and, uh, and making your platform so appealing. And they do grandfather, like some apps are in the store now that would not get approved anymore, and Apple has grandfathered them in. But the thing is, there's no predictability. Like, it happens sometimes, doesn't happen others. The keyboard guy in Apple said, you can't call a keyboard. She's like, I didn't call it, I wrote my own. They're like, no, the point was the keyboard. So in some cases, you know, it, it, it's very apparent in others, like drafts, where it's just a button that does something. It's very, it, it's very arguable, and we'll see what happens. But it is, I think it really is... And I say this not to, you know, some people say, oh, you're making excuses for Apple. I'm just trying to explain what it is, because I think if you don't understand the process, it's easy, it's easy to see, it, it's harder to, sign, to see where the pressure needs to be applied. Mm -hmm. um, and, yeah, and, and again, Apple, you know, the App Store is not one thing. It's got parts of it are in marketing, parts of it are in services, parts of it are in software. So it's, it's, a, it's a larger sort of a, a needle to thread. In happier news, Peter, Apple announced that they now have holiday stations on your beloved iTunes radio. Um, yeah, I guess if you like holiday music, sure. <laughs> uh, I can tell you love holiday music. <laughs> Absolutely, yes. I live for holiday music. So is it's now is Christmas it good holiday, holiday music? music. Is it good holiday music or is it pop, like pop song Ized holiday music. Like, is it a classic? Are we getting I think something Crosby? Different. I think there's a lot of different stations on there. I don't know. Peter, he looks so happy right now. I just kind of want to ask him about holiday music some more. <laughs> Peter works yeah. retail. Anyone that works retail has a natural hate for holiday music, I think, because they start playing it in October. It's when true. I, yeah. when I we, keep it, we, we, we keep it out of our store because, um, uh, well, I'd like to say, I, I'd like to come up with some altruistic expectation, like, like, uh, uh, we don't want to feel like our, or we don't want our customers to feel like they're being manipulated into spending more money than they have by, uh, you know, filling them with a false uh, sense of guilt um, about not buying more expensive Christmas presents. But the plain and simple fact of the matter is because we all completely detest it. So <laughs> because, you'll uh, yeah, because you don't want to go crazy. Let's well, because literally, when you when you step outside our door, you hear it being piped in across the street. Oh, so the weather outside is frightful. <laughs> right, exactly. It's so so our, our our store is is a humble little sanctuary of you know whatever music we want to hear that day, whether it's indie rock just or shake it off. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> shake it off. Shake off the holiday music. Yeah, when I used to work at um at Apple Retail um in Western Mass, the uh, the worst Christmas I ever worked was when they decided that Santa karaoke was a good idea. <laughs> oh. Oh, and, uh, so the Santa the Santa booth was directly like two floors down. So anytime you got to the front of our store, you would hear various people trying to sing karaoke with Santa. It was it was mm, very was, special. was Peter one of those people? Yes, I'm sure. <laughs> Peter Peter didn't know me at that point, but he still wanted to torture. Peter me. was standing two floors up, throwing things down <laughs> in rage. Renee, I wanted to talk about the uh, the best apps roundup. That yeah, and I also wanted to ask you about Hour of Code. Oh yeah, Hour of Code. That's this week. That's Thursday, yes. um, which is pretty exciting. Uh, so yeah, let's talk about Hour of Code first, and then we'll talk about the best apps. So Hour of Code, um, Code.org is partnered with Apple um, to, and as well as a, a number of tech organizations, uh, to promote coding for for younger kids as well as folks of all ages. And Apple is hosting one hour Hour of Code uh, introductions, uh, mostly designed around children, 
but I, I hear from birdies that it's it is an all ages thing, and you can go and not feel awkward when you're sitting next to the twelve year olds who are so much smarter than you, and picking <laughs> this up faster because darn their little magical ever expanding brains. Um, but you no, know, I mean I think it's a really cool initiative, and Apple's also the day prior and the day after they're doing some interviews with uh, with developers around the world in some of their flagship stores, which I also think is really awesome. It's just it's such a it's a good initiative, and it it really highlights also Apple's workshops, which I think don't get enough credit. Like yeah. the the free workshops that Apple puts on are so helpful for folks, um, and they do them for like all kinds of different um, different. And avenues and, and interests, but the fact that they're opening it up to something like basic coding and introductory development is really, really awesome. So it's and that's I this that's Thursday, a, right? That's Thursday. It's Thursday. I think from five to six. Um, they're starting at very, four here, so it'll, it'll yeah. depend on your store. But it's uh, Thursday. If you're listening to this on a, you don't know which week we're talking about. It's December eleventh. I want to say. Yeah, I think December December eleventh. Yes, Thursday, December eleventh is the the day of the day of coding. The hour you of can code. Sign up at apple.com/slash/slash your country code slash retail. Yeah, I will say that um, they're only because they're only hosting one session. The sessions are filling up pretty quickly. Most of all the sessions in Boston and Rhode Island area are already snapped up shut. But even if you aren't uh, able to make it there in person and you want to learn more, I would suggest going to Apple's Hour of Code page as well as checking out their starter documents on coding Objective-C because I think that Apple's documentation is some of the best in the business and it's a really good way to uh, kind of open your eyes. And we will be posting something probably on Thursday of like, here are some great introductory ways to, to get into coding for OS X and iOS. Because Red and I can totally pass for K-12. to Oh yeah, <laughs> no. You know what? Put me in pigtails and like. That's what I said. That yeah. was my jam. Exactly, Renee. You'll have to shave though. Ah, uh, uh, yeah, that's fine. I'll wear one, I'll wear one of those flu masks. It'll be fine. Oh god, yeah. Just big, big, wide eyes. My my child just has a has a hair condition. Don't you judge them. Um, so sorry, yeah, you wanted to talk about the apps too. Yeah. So best apps. Um. So in in what is probably my like. I, I feel very, very happy um, that Apple picked two best apps um, of, of the year. And uh, one of those apps was a game category, and one of those apps was an overall. And their overall app was an app named Elevate, which is a pretty cool way to sort of train your brain to do various tasks. A lot of people have sort of rolled their eyes and demeaned the idea of, um, of brain trainers, just like random brain trainers, but Elevate does it in a really smart way, I think, in that they're focused on specific tasks that you can actually improve upon, like your reading comprehension, and how fast you can do simple number uh, calculations when you're like working with bills and tips. And it's, it, makes really, it makes a lot of sense, and I, I really like that app. I've been playing around with it for a couple months now. But the best game of the year is threes. <laughs> threes, which I have championed all year and, and, and love to pieces, and people have created numerous clones of it that have for some reason... Good. Gotten, no, 2048 is okay, Twenty, but it's boring. Like, you top left. Part of what makes threes so great for me is the sounds. Yeah. I feel like I'm like... I, some people, like, I know a lot of people that mute it. I'm like, why? Put on headphones. It's... it's I don't know. That's just... A, it's a fun game, and it's got fun sound effects, and... Yeah, it's it's funner than some of the games that came out after that. Yeah, and I may um I may do an external link. I over when I was still at MacWorld, I wrote a a giant game guide on threes um with some some tips on sort of getting past the 384 tile and uh which is very funny because these tips with the tips, I still like I, I wrote all of these, and I'm I'm you know I'll get up to like seventy thousand or or something, but I, I can't I can't get over that hump for some reason. I just haven't been able to. And I gave this tips piece to a friend of mine, and within like two days, she had gotten up to the very last uh, thing. <laughs> Isn't that and frustrating? And she was like, I just followed your advice. I'm like, what are you reading? It's like my How cousin could do Rubik's cubes in eleven seconds, and I never understood it. It's just joking. yeah. It's madness. I understand the theory behind Rubik's cubes, but my brain doesn't comprehend I them. I just took all the stickers off and put the stickers back on. That was yep. my 
my brother has like those five by five ones and the like the larger I guess like two by twos are supposedly the hardest like just the little ones oh. um, he's like a Rubik's cube nerd like he can do them all in several you know just a few seconds and I don't I don't get it he tries to explain it and like I understand how and why it works like when you do like the different ways of spinning it but my brain doesn't comprehend it that maybe I just need to use elevate more often <laughs> yeah maybe elevate elevate uh, developers, you guys should add a Rubik's Cube option just for fun. So yeah. not to be left out, but Peter, they the were best Mac apps of the year, too. Notability for apps and Tomb Raider for games. What did you think? Yeah, solid choices. Tomb Raider is really fantastic. It was a port by Feral Interactive. They um, came out with it earlier this year. Um, and Notability is an absolutely fantastic note slash getting things done app that if you haven't checked out, you absolutely should. Yeah, it I was iPad, that. right? Yeah, yeah. I love, uh, Notability is great for anyone who has to take, like, uh, college kids, high school kids, anyone who uses an iPad in the classroom, because I believe Notability uh, lets you record audio as well. So being able to record little snippets and take handwritten notes or type notes, or it, it's just, it's very flexible. Yeah, it's awesome. It's very um, cool. Yeah, and all these apps working on it. Like, Apple has this whole section for better together, and they really are getting to these these apps that, that w if you have one or the other, it's fine. But if you have the Mac version and an iPhone and or iPad version, it's just outstanding. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think it's interesting, actually, that they um, the, the Mac highlighted Tomb Raider as the game of the year, despite the fact that it, you know, it, it did come to the Mac a little bit later than it came to other platforms. I think it is a top, you know, a fantastic game. Um, it is probably one of my favorite in that genre, um, not only the Tomb Raider series, but just in terms of like the the first person running around exploration. Yeah, it puzzles. rejuvenated that. Both Tomb Raider, it, it rejuvenated the franchise for me. It was it was very very good, um, but I do think it's interesting the divide between the Mac and iOS. Whereas yeah. on iOS, we really are seeing people like of the of the list of of game of the year runner up and the best games list, um, we've got. Hitman Go from a from Square from a pre-existing series, um, and we've got an XCOM game. Um, but otherwise, in terms of like those are still those are both um, reinventions of a franchise. They're not necessarily just straight ports, um, and you don't really see that. Like you scrolling through Crazy Taxi City Rush, you know, it's like you've got you've got people where they're like building off the format but they're creating brand new games for it whereas the Mac um, is mostly games that we've already seen on other platforms. And apps. Exception. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. SimCity 4, the Lego movie video game, Metal Gear Rising. Yeah, last year, I mean, Napkin, our app of the, our Mac app of the year last year, Napkin was completely, totally a Mac app. It wasn't ported from anywhere else. It was designed and built with the Mac in mind. Okay. I don't know. Well, if I mean, in the interest. In fairness, you know, the, the runner-up uh, for Game of the Year from Apple is a game called Transistor, which is available for Mac and Linux only. Um, it, that's come, very cool. Yeah, it'll come to other platforms, but, uh, you know, that's that's more or less an original. But uh, to, to your point, um, actually, I think you can get it for PS4 as well, but uh, to your point, you're absolutely right, you know, the, the and it, it remains a problem of market share. You know, the... the uh, iOS devices and Macs operate in very different worlds in that, you know, iOS devices, not only iOS devices themselves, but especially the, the people who are downloading and, and uh, installing apps spend money on them in ways that they don't on other platforms um, it, for the most part. You know, there's some equanimity in the Android sphere for uh, for sure, but there a lot a lot more people spend money on iOS apps than they do on um, Android apps or you know Windows Phone apps or what have you. So that's where a lot of the heat and light in mobile development is because the developers and publishers stand a better chance of recouping their investment. Um, the the Mac is ascendant. The Mac is growing in popularity, but the Mac still represents a very very small slice of the overall PC market, um, and it just doesn't attract the same uh, first. Uh, tier AAA development that you get on the PC or really more or less consoles these days. You know, there's still a lot of original PC game development going on, uh, but, uh, you know, consoles are really where the heat and the light are. 
So, uh, you know, you get games like Tomb Raider, which are terrific ports, very serviceable, and yeah, it takes a while for them to come out uh, for the Mac, and that's not to say anything uh, to diminish them. You know, and you also get games that were released more recently, like... Uh, uh, Civilization Beyond Earth, for example, and Geometry Wars. These are, again, ports from other platforms, you know, ports from the PC, ports from uh, from consoles, but they work very well on the Mac as well. And unfortunately, that's the situation that we've been in ever since, really, the 80s. Uh, you know, there was a time where the Mac attracted a lot of original game development, but <clears throat> not so much anymore, and I don't think it will again unless we ever get to a point where, you know, Mac sales are on parity, uh, with with PCs and you know you're still talking about small double digit uh, percentages overall. So unfortunately, we just don't see that uh, that that triple A uh, development. This is why I've lobbied for many years for Apple to take you know some of the billions that it's got set aside and create its own internal game development studio. I would love to see that happen. It's something that Sony did when the PlayStation first got started. You know, it had 989 Studios and and a few other efforts um, to to uh, uh, create original properties for its uh, its console to show how well it could be done. Uh, Nintendo, of course, you know Nintendo's strength with with the Wii U and with the the 3DS and with all of the um, the game systems that it's developed over the years has really always resided in first party development in games like Super Smash Brothers or um, <clears throat> excuse me the Mario uh, stuff or Zelda, you know, for example. Um, games that were developed internally at Nintendo and that have been published by Nintendo. Um, <clears throat> the same sort of, uh, uh, of thing has existed for a very long time with the Xbox as well. I mean, famously, you know, Mac developers threw up their hands in disgust, uh, or Mac gamers threw up their hands in disgust many years ago when uh, Microsoft bought Bungie, which up until then had been a Mac-centric developer that had also done some PC work with its Myth game series and uh, had ported its uh, its Marathon game series to uh, to PC as well, but was primarily identified as a Mac game developer. Um, and, of course, Bungie uh, got swept up by Microsoft to make Halo as an Xbox exclusive. And Halo is, you know, perennially one of the most popular franchises for the Xbox platform. So, you know, it, 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 it happens. But I, I would love to see Apple reverse course there and uh, do its own internal development. I don't think it ever will. But it is kind of a pipe dream of mine that I've uh, bandied about for many years. Give Peter a call. He's got ideas. I know, right? <laughs> All right, so Peter, if people do want to reach you, if they do want to find your ideas, if they do want to get inspiration for what to do next, where can they go? Oh, they can go straight to hell. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. No, you can find me that's on social John media. John Constantine at. That's right, yes. Um, uh, you can find me on social media at Flarg, F-L-A-R-G-H, and of course on the pages virtual or otherwise of imore.com. And what about you, Allie? Uh, I am on imore.com every day, and I am at iMuggle on all of the social things. Does, Twi does uh, Kaya have her own social networking yet? Uh, she has a Twitter. She nice. sure does. It's at findthesheeb. <laughs> we only post the creepy pictures there where she likes to lurk and hide. and So, yeah. All she right. looks so incredibly bored right now. I yeah, know. She she's pretty much bored with all humanity 90% of the time. So. She's just yawning she is away. the darkest sheeb. <laughs> <laughs> what about you, Ren? Uh, you can find me at Setern, S-E-T-T-E-R-N, on all of the things, all of them, as well as on imore.com. Uh, you can find me at Rene Ritchie. You can find this show usually on Thursdays at 11 a.m. Pacific, 2 p.m. Eastern. But the holidays are going to make things crazy, so I'm not sure when we're going to record. But we will be recording. So if you if you miss us live, you can find us at uh, youtubecom slash video or in iTunes or on RSS. Just look for the helpful links below the show. I want to thank everybody for joining us. Uh, Peter, Ali, Ren, thank you guys so much. Once again, iconicbook.com. Com, promo code IMORE, 10% off. Thank you, Iconic. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. And we will see you next time. Goodbye. Goodbye. <laughs> <laughs>